the discussions behind these were leaked. So actually what the union president said behind everybody's back was what was leaked. So now they are conducting a witch hunt to find that person and to fire that person also. They are actually threatening with taking legal action against both that person and my father. Right. So uh, this, this goes then. Remember we were talking about institutional betrayal and institutional dharma. Now all of a sudden the institution itself is claiming to be the victim because someone spoke the truth of what was happening in meetings behind closed doors. So they have denied that there was abuse to you. They have attacked you and your father by firing him and smearing and trying to silence you. And then they've reversed the victim and offender by saying that they're the victim of a whistleblower and turning yeah. it around. So tell me what happened with the group of pastors being told to sign something. What happened there? I think it depends uh, who are you asking. Okay. Because um, if you're asking, I think if you take the perspective of a whistleblower or you take the perspective of the pastor who was making fun of me being raped in marriage, as it's just a stupid allegation. So you have very different views of it. I'm very sure the pastor who made fun of it will say, oh, we just want to find a person because we have to clean this church. Right. And I'm right. pretty sure the whistleblower would say, um, there's a lot of pressure. That's my right. point. Of, but so, yes, they made them sign a document to give okay, over their personal phones, their personal laptops, personal emails to conduct an investigation, like not their work ones, because they don't have those, the personal ones, which is in itself a criminal act. They do not have the right for that. Police has the right for that. Judges have the right for that. They don't have the right to just collect them, to ask them. Actually, they were like, pressure, like you have to sign this paper that you're willingly giving it over to us. And then logically thinking, if you say, oh no, that's violating my rights, I'm not gonna sign it, then automatically, oh, you're the whistleblower. Right, so it's but a But then no if you sign it, then you gave your permission. So it's like, what do you want? You gave us permission. So it's so, very well played out. Let me just back off from this, just to zoom out just a little bit. So I want to make sure that our audience is understanding and what's happened. They, they've been antagonistic and sabotaging your desire to be safe and protected all the way through on many, many levels. Um, lots of double abuse and re-traumatization. And then when it came down to it, they tried to stick false allegations on your dad and when he was exonerated because it was false then they fired him from his position yeah. in church leadership as the president of that particular conference then in a very short order after that within the next week two weeks there was a meeting mm -hmm. where all of the pastors were together and they were told that in order to conduct a mole hunt to find the whistleblower they were told that they had to voluntarily sign away their permission to give digital access to their personal phones, personal laptops, personal devices, personal emails, personal text messages. So I just have a question. Will they be conducting church discipline for everyone for whom they find pornography or other sexually explicit material on the, the personal laptops of all these pastors? Oh, I was told by the conference president where my ex is that pornography is a very common problem with pastors and it's not reason to like discipline or to fire someone. So no, I don't think they will. Interesting. So your dad gets fired for protecting the truth, for standing up for the truth and protecting his daughter. Um, but all of this is considered acceptable. Honestly, it sounds, th this level of double standard. Pardon? A lot of double standards. It's like we have this church manual and policy and we use it when it fits us. And when it does not fit us, it's like, ah, you know, forgiveness and Christianity, you know, second chance and so on. Right. So uh, just, I mean, when I, when I look at the amount of double standards, the coercive control on an institutional level, the violation of privacy on an institutional level, um, 
it sounds like, I mean, to use current politics, it sounds like a strategy straight out of Putin's playbook. I mean, the this is like a KGB thing. Come to life in a church leadership environment. And to me, and I'm not expecting you to answer these questions, Anita, but it raises profoundly disturbing questions that I think have to be asked. Because I've read the whistleblower documentation. I've read the articles. There are multiple articles on the link that I dropped underneath. And the whistleblower documentation indicates that the union president who has just who has levied these demands of all the pastors to hand over their personal devices and so on and so forth, that, that he was actually, this coercive action was approved by his next boss, who is the president of the Trans-European Division. That's one of the 13 yeah. world divisions. So the, the whistleblower documentation indicates that the president of the Serbian Union was acting with the approval and possibly even the encouragement, if not the directive, of the Trans-European Division president. So this leads me to ask, how high up does this corruption go? Why has there been nearly radio silence in all de denominational media fronts? about this story. It's been, it's been on national news in Serbia. It's broken with investigative journalism in the United States. Why has there been no response, not a denial, not a demand for retraction, nothing for the investigative journalism reporting? I want to know, where are the leaders with integrity who are speaking out against this kind of injustice, these double standards, not only the coercive control trying to track down a whistleblower, but the egregious endorsement of marital rape, of sexual abuse, and of, of spiritual abuse. Is this truly, is, is the silence an endorsement from the global church headquarters on the way down? Are, is the GC president tacitly endorsing coercive control? Is he endorsing the negligible impact of marital rape and sexual child abuse? Is he, is he making this type of, of leadership and this lack of care and protection for the vulnerable? Is, is he saying that this is a standard acceptable baseline? I want to know. I want to know. I would like to know. Nobody is, is speaking out about this. Where are the leaders with a conscience? Because if you have a conscience, this should make you unable to sleep at night. And if you are able to sleep at night all the way through all of this, then clearly you're not operating with one. So I want to know. I don't think I'm the only one. I'm watching the, 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 the comments roll up here. I don't think I'm the only one. Who wants to know answers to these questions? And this isn't just the Seventh-day Adventist denomination. There are situations like this mm -hmm. in the Catholic denomination, in the Latter-day Saints denomination, in the Southern Baptist Convention, Independent Fundamental Baptists, Amish, Mennonite, Jehovah's Witnesses, you name it, non-denominational, congregational churches. It exists so many places. But you know what? In a structure like the Catholic Church, like the Seventh-day Adventist Church, where there are multiple layers of regional administration, somebody should be saying something. This isn't a single congregation operating with zero oversight in their own neighborhood, and nobody else has any kind of administrative power. I know. That's my rant. I, I, I know you don't have the answers, Anita. I don't have the answers, but somebody needs to be asking the questions. So let's get back to your story. In, and you know, you've been in our wild support groups. You know that we hear stories like this multiple times a week. Were there materials that you read or that you were given that actually made this journey worse for you? Um, well, there's not that much material available here where I live, like you have in the States. 
-hmm. but there were two books that I find extremely damaging when it's in the context of an abusive relationship. First was Fireproof, which is basically, you just keep doing, you just keep giving and accept whatever is coming because, you know, that's coming. You just have to continue, you just have to continue. And the other was The Power of the Praying Wife. Now, if it would be a healthy relationship, I say, it's a great book. Read it, pray for your husband, and I'm sure it will do good. But when it's an abusive relationship, it does so much damage because you keep praying and praying and praying. And even when I left, you know, I was told, just don't tell anybody because he's still a pastor and people won't be coming, but just pray, pray and it will get, it will get better. You'll see, you just have to pray. And it's like, no. Like, I can pray as much as I want if he does not want to change. If he's refusing to work on himself, I can be praying till the day I die and that will stay the same. So I found it. And now I don't hear you. I can, I, I hear you. Oh, okay. Okay. You, you went away for a moment. I'm just so yeah, those, two, those two were the ones that I read and I I found it damaging because it made me keep wanting to try and keep giving more and just fueled that idea that only if I become like this only if I do that only if I but nothing was ever enough nothing was good enough nothing nothing really worked were there resources that did have a healing impact on you? Well, I mean, this is not marketing for you, but your resources did help me. So this is not paid marketing. No. No, when I, when I got to your group, the <laughs> first message. thing that helped me, the first thing that really helped me is to see that there are other people like me, to understand that I did not go crazy, to understand that um, I'm not alone, to understand that abuse um, functions, like the base of the abuse is always the same. The ways of the abuse, the extent of the abuse, it will change and vary depending on the situation. But the base of it, it's always the same. And to like realize that, and you had first, I started downloading your free resources because I was out with no career, no job, I couldn't afford anything, but you had free resources, which also were really good help just to understand what abuse is. And once you understand it, once you get into it, it's much easier to deal with it. Right. It's much easier to anticipate it. And it's much easier to like protect yourself from it. Mm -hmm. So without that knowledge, you know, I was just a crazy person. And I kept telling myself, like, you know, there has to be a problem with me. And I kept looking into myself. But then when I understood the basis of it, it was like, huh, okay, there are ways to handle this. And then you did all those lives. I mean, you went live and you did your, there weren't seminars, but there were just short videos. Right. And I remember, you know, going around, washing dishes, cleaning the house with the headphones in my, in my ear, and then just listening to it. And it made me feel like a normal person. It made me, it gave me hope that if you went through it, you overcame it. And you can now work with women who go through the same thing without being triggered because trigger is like a, a, a very difficult part of trauma. And it's something that, that is still present in my life and it makes life very hard. Uh, with time, they get less and less, but the intensity of it, it does not, I mean, it hasn't, haven't gone down for me yet. But then looking at you, it's like, oh, that gives me hope. Like that type of healing is possible. So that's where I kind of found myself. And then there was a lot of support, a lot of material, a lot of material that's available for anybody. Right. And that was life-saving. Mm. I'm, so I'm so glad. I'm so glad. I mean, that's, that's, why we, that's why we do what we do. And, you know, and I know God looks for it. it. He does. And I know that you've got some amazing ideas for how you are going to turn around and reach back behind you to the women who are in the fire behind you 
and you have gifts that I don't have. I mean, you, you speak languages I can't speak and you can reach women I can't reach and you have a story that is unique to you. So tell us a little bit about what your dreams are. What are you going to do? For the future, it's still a dream, but I hope that one day, it still requires some healing, but I hope in the near future, we will be able to, um, actually my lawyers are helping me and they're also wanting to help when it comes to this. The problem here is that there are no organizations, no materials like you have in the States, no support groups. I mean, I haven't found an actual support group here with women who went through the same thing. Um, and women kind of, they get lost in the system. They don't know where to go, who to go to, which lawyer to take, because lawyers, let's be honest, they, take, they tend to take advantage of situations. Uh, psychologists or psychotherapists, um, they're not all trauma-informed. And when a person is not trauma-informed, they can cause more harm than good. And I had experience in both of those things. It took time until I found the right lawyer until I found the right therapist. And after I went on national TV, there were women contacting me like, sure. oh, you're so brave for speaking out. Like, I wish I could. Or I went through this and that and I'm stuck in the system. And, and can you help me? Like, and I was like, there's such a huge need for it. And I'm not a therapist. I cannot like help them help them. What I could is to guide them. What I could is to gather a group of professionals to um, fund a nonprofit organization, which could um, give, let's say, help them find their way, help them find the right legal advice, help them find the right psychologist, just to like help them get on the right road to recovery and to being able to uh, get to a safe place, to fight in court, to have lawyers who are not going to be solved because corruption is, I mean, let's face it, I think all around the world, it's a thing, sadly. So my dream is to have a whole team of lawyers, of professionals who will be able to help when somebody comes to me or anybody else who will be working in this organization. Because I already have a couple of people who lined up who would want to help. Because this is, let's face it, it's not a one-person job. Absolutely not. And when they come, we can just like guide them. Okay, you can go to the psychologist, see that lawyer, and just help them on the way. And I think like that would have meant the world to me back then. Right. But I had to find my own way. And I thank God I managed. And I thank God I had the support of my parents. Because without that, I don't know where I would be. Yeah. No, I understand. Uh, I mean, that right there. You just described wild seven years ago. I don't know what you're going to call Let's hope I won't take seven years to realize it. I hope not. But you know what? But, but seven years ago, I was just like, I am determined to give other women what I needed. Whatever wasn't there for me, I want to be able to turn around. And you know, it's one of the things that I have loved about our wild community, and I see this a lot, is that we don't say you have to be fully done and 20 years on the other side of it. All you have to do is take ownership of where you are in your recovery process and just turn around and pass the bucket of water back toward the flames to the woman who's behind you. And she passes it to the woman who's behind her. And so each of us, wherever we're at, we keep just turning around and helping the woman behind us and that is one of the things that is beautiful about this community and the culture of survivor support. And I know there are other resources as well. I know um, some of uh, my friends who are watching this are dropping comments and links to other great organizations if you're watching in the bottom, I mean, in the, in the comments underneath. Um, you know, I, I want to just throw out that uh, I, I'm sure that there are women who are watching this right now and somebody sent this to you or you stumbled on it and you're saying, that's, that's me. I'm Anita. I'm Sarah several years ago. I'm Anita right now. I'm Anita eight years ago when, when she was in the beginning of this and she hadn't even realized any of it yet. 
Um, and if that's you, I have linked a quiz about whether or not you can trust your resources. It's a free quiz right underneath. And if you get to the end and it tells you, you know what, <laughs> you could use some safer resources. It will give you some options for safer resources, things that you can do. And also, we have just launched a brand new groundbreaking mobile app. And I am so excited about this. This is the first live video that I have mentioned this on. So I want to, I'm going to drop this. You can get to the app through the quiz too, but I'm just going to drop this one little comment underneath. And this is the Trauma Mamas mobile app. It's available on Google Play and App Store anywhere in the world. It's currently only in English, but Anita, maybe we could make it in Serbian. What do you think? Maybe we can. <laughs> I that don't know. Sound, no, like seriously, people here, they don't have resources. That no. We just don't. Yeah. And it would be such a great help to, to like bring something, not just to the church, because I believe there are a lot of people stuck in the church, not daring to speak up I believe oh, the church yeah. made an example out of me what happens to those who speak up right it's like for women whatever they do um they are judged if they speak up then oh you're strong enough to speak up so you weren't abused because abused people don't have strength like they, they wouldn't be able to do it if you keep quiet then um well you should have said something since you didn't say anything we couldn't help you if right. you so your husband, then, oh, it's revenge. It must be revenge. If you don't do anything, then why didn't you do it? You should have, we, we're not competent to make a decision. You have to go to court. So whatever women do, they are judged. And I really hope to have a place for women when they're just accepted and guided and helped. Yeah. So before we get to my last question, I just want to throw something out. If you have watched this, maybe you've gone and you've taken some time and thoroughly reviewed the investigative reporting. If you have questions or opinions that you would like to express to the church leaders who have handled this in this way, um, you can either message me and I can give you direct emails for those church leaders or you can send your letter and your thoughts to the investigative reporter. And the investigative reporter will make sure that your letters are seen if you are willing to do that. So you can send your comments and thoughts on the handling of this, of Anita's case to the investigative journalist at, there you go, dropped it in. If anyone feels so moved. Um, Anita, one last question, two, two okay. last questions. Before we, before I ask the very last question, I'm gonna go out on a limb and guess that all of this court stuff because I don't I don't know if you specified earlier but from what I understand there are nine open court cases two of them being two of them in criminal court against your ex even though the church is defending him nine open yes. court cases two in criminal court church still says you're the problem um I'm gonna guess that hasn't been free for you just a yeah. random guess. Is there a place, if anyone feels so moved, that they could help you out as you fight this? The investigative journalist um, created a GoFundMe website and I'm eternally grateful for everybody who has already donated some money. It means so much to us. And if anybody would like to, I think Sarah can link the GoFundMe underneath it. And yeah, thank you for everybody. Thank you even for just watching this and sharing this. And 
bringing awareness and for all your help. We're very thankful. Thank you, all of you. Anita, this is my last question. If there are church leaders watching this right now, what would you say to them? That's a big one. I think I would say that for the church leaders who have daughters and who are watching this, I want to tell them, your daughters are watching you now. Mm -hmm. You're setting an example in how you're treating me, how you're treating my children, our safety. You're setting an example for your daughter. And your son. And just, just keep that in mind. Like, I do not wish this on anybody, but I pray for a church that will one day put safety before image. Because mm. I believe that that's what Jesus would do. I agree. I agree. Thank you, Anita, for your courage. I know that none of this has been easy. Thank you for your determination, for your dogged, unending pursuit of the truth. Thank you for your fierceness, even when you're terrified. Thank, Thank you for sharing my story, even when people are determined to make the story go away and to keep this I think we just blew quiet. that out. I think there are I a lot. Everybody. Pardon? I say I appreciate it a lot. My pleasure. I, I think that um, there's a lot of accountability that needs to be answered. And I hope that this is one step in that direction. Also, um, I just saw there is a direct PayPal link so hold on a second. I'm going to, I, I know someone asked if they could send by PayPal directly uh, because of the, the GoFundMe fees. So I will drop that link in underneath as soon as we're done. And thank you guys. Thank you for being here. Thank you for hanging out. I know this is a long one. Tech and glitches and yeah, it was back. not half an hour. <laughs> I as and you asked me at the beginning, how long should we do this? I said, Oh, let's play for 30 minutes. People tap out after about 30 minutes. So I think that was what two hours ago. But it's worth it. And I thank you everybody for sticking all the way to the end. Thank you. And thank those. you for your time. Yes, please share it. Pass this on. Read the articles, share the articles, write the letters, make your voice heard. If Anita can stand up after everything she's been through and seek truth and make her voice heard, then you can consider how you can make your voice heard. What truth do you have to speak and to seek in your life? Whether it's on Anita's behalf, or maybe you're gonna borrow some of her courage for your own situation. All right, have a wonderful evening, everyone.